Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hometown Cable, our program, and every Sunday, and specials every Sunday, called What's Going On Here? My name is Bob Venn. I'm your host today, and Calvin Castine has the camera. And we move around doing different things, and it's always nice to meet new people. We, I get around, and I see some people I've never met, and it's even nicer to see people that you've seen before and who've been on with us uh, on our show before, and this is one of those people today. His name is Terrence Gilroy. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're in Denimora, New York, at his residence. Uh, we've we've had Terrence on that I remember at least twice. Once here, uh, talking about <laughs> I got to refresh. The, we talked World about War the II. prison, World War Two, and the veterans, and a list of names that he's doing. And then we also talked to him a very short time when they did the monument in Plattsburgh, uh, Pikes Cantonment. Pikes Cantonment. Uh, we had a pretty extensive coverage on that. I thought the best coverage in the northern New York. We did. We, did, we had a lot on that, and it showed. And I've heard some good reports. And Terrence is a uh, KFC. He's a uh, Legion, Legion VFW, VFW, and all. And in addition to that, he's a historian. You're a historian in the town too. Correct. And he likes to do different projects. So just a little bit before we get into our project today, tell us a little bit about Terrence. Just sketch about a little bit about you again, where you were born and background. Well, native stock, uh, been born right here in Denimora. We, uh, my brothers and sisters, all live here. We've grown right up here. Worked for the state. All my my father and grandfathers and my and the Gilroy State came off the turnpike. And my, on the other side, they were all Connorses out of Peru. So, the better part of the last 150 years or so, we've had local family members up and down the county. And my father had been a supervisor in Beekman Town prior to his coming up here in 1919. And I said, we've lived right here all our lives. The only time I've been out of the area is when I was in service, World War II. Mm -hmm. You married a local girl? No, I married a, the, my wife, Gertrude, uh, was going to college down here. She was, uh, And that's how I got to meet her after World War II, and we decided we she liked this area. We decided we'd stay here and get married. And we uh, have had we had uh, three uh, children. Our two boys worked for the Department of Correction. They followed myself and my father in that line, and they're downstate. And our daughter lives and works in Plattsburgh. So your wife learned to like snow. Is that what uh, you had one of the first snowfalls in the whole northern? <laughs> the first ones, huh? Just about you. Annually, we're a little late this year. <laughs> yeah, we're just, you know, it's not October yet. Give well, it a chance. No. <laughs> but it's another gorgeous day. We were in Lime Mountain just two days ago, and it was a beautiful one. The best day I think I've had in six weeks. And today's another beautiful day, isn't it? Is our gorgeous day. So I, you have been historian how long? Twenty-five years. So not only are you historian for the people in general, but as you go around and look. You see all your relatives in all these, because your relatives are all from this area. You must find their names all over the place. Yeah, we find quite a few of them. Uh -huh. Okay, mm -hmm. and you've had different projects. Now, the one is the one that we talked about before, where you're trying to get every name of anybody who served in World War II and one, both? No, no, just World War World II. World War II? From Clinton County. From Clinton County, trying to get a list. And you're still finding new ones all the time? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, don't know why they were left out, but... Uh, still progressing this I've had people ask me this what's happened and I think that they are a little perturbed that it seems to take so long but the thing is that as I go through and I do this day by day and I check off these names with my list and if they don't mention them then I add them to them and I've changed some of these lists three and four times because names have been added to it. So do you go through old newspapers and just look for a name that, you know, during the 40s and say, oh, I don't, I don't know that guy, and then go over and okay. kind of add it? Well, I, did, I decided not to do it on a haphazard manner. I, I have 1943 done and 1944, and this is day by day articles that were in the paper, mm -hmm. and they are at the county historian's office. Okay. There's only going to be one of these that okay. will be available on, on this vein of, of history. Okay. That brings us right up till today. So somewhere along the line, in the past month or so, uh, Con Calvin contacted you, or you contacted him, or he heard something about some new project you got. How'd that happen? Well, a while ago, I went up to Lake Placid to a historical thing up there to the old railroad station, and they got talking about uh, the life in Lake Placid and how the railroad came in, and 
the development of Lake Placid. And on the way home, I'd gone up with Carlton, my brother, and I said, you know, the thing is that this has been lost here in Denimora. We had the railroad here, and it went on through to Lion Mountain, and Paul Smith, and then Lake Placid, and, and Saranac Lake. And why don't we try to bring this back? Because when you mention this, there's people who stand there to well, I didn't know we had that. <laughs> yes. And I think that in sense, this is what you people do excellently, to bring this back to the people that these things have been here, they have been lost, but we should bring them back and show the people that, yes, we did have it, and it was part of our life. And once you get into some of these things and realize the depth of what these people worked with and, and what they had in their lifetime as compared to today, you know, Transportation being a, a big thing. Uh, we just had the DNH here the other day down Plasburg when they were come through. And railroads have always been important. They've been very important from Ross's Point, Champlain, with the old uh, Lake Champlain, Ogdensburg Railroad, the uh, building of the railroad up here to Denimora, the, the building of the prison here, uh, the mines at Lion Mountain. All these things interconnect and this is what I said, we the people have forgotten a lot of these things and I hope that doing these things they can say, well, I'd like to know more about it. Mm -hmm. And okay. I think that what you did here, as you said, with Lion Mountain, having worked there, I had some idea as to what was there. And again, this, the inside of, of that probably has been lost because I understand it's filled with water, but people only knew what what you had in there as right. a... Uh, we're going to take a short break, but before we do, we know you mentioned that people didn't realize there was a railroad here. I was talking to a lady this morning who called me from Champlain, lives on Oak Street, and been there for three years, and within 200 feet, 300 feet from her house, and she goes by it every day, crosses over. I did, asked her if she realized there was a railroad across that street she's on. She had no idea. Been there three years, never came up in conversation. There's still like a the roadbed, but they've used it for something else, and she never realized it. Now, there's a person there about three years, and unless someone brings it to her attention, like you're doing here, it, you, we don't realize these things. We'll be right back. Uh, we're talking with Terrence uh, Gilroy, and he's going to be telling us about this new project. It sounded very interesting. And how many people out there know about the Plattsburg, Denimora, Lime Mountain, all the way up there, railroad, except for Ralph Gilpin. Ralph Gilpin knew that. He told me that a long time ago. He's our town clerk. I suppose a sketchy, at least here, is in order before we get into the actual railroad about Denimore. How did Denimore get here? How did the prison get here? We're talking 150 years ago, I guess, for the prison. Prison. Right? right. Okay. Was Denimore here before the prison? It was part of the town of Beatman Town. But was there anybody living here and was yes. to keep them here? Yeah, there was some small mining concern here. And uh, the state of New York uh, decided that they needed more space for uh, incarcerated inmates. And they put Ransom Cook from Saratoga Springs in charge of doing a survey of the state of New York for mineral rights. The idea at that time was to get the cost of these institutions off the taxpayers back which is kind of unusual you know and yeah. <laughs> today it's said <laughs> everything but so they they wanted the institutions to be self-sufficient and ransom cook come up here and he saw the outcropping of, of the rock and he decided to say that this was the best place in the state of new york to use inmate labor to mine the iron ore and to develop it and yeah. that way they would sell it and keep the cost of uh, the institution off the taxpayers back. But poor Ransom probably didn't know that it had he gone to Lion Mountain and got into the ore beds that were there rather than here, it probably would have been a much different story because mm -hmm. of the, the, this didn't work out that well. Uh, they didn't have the depth of, of ore here. And after the state once, like a lot of things, had their money invested, they didn't want to pull up stake and go and start someplace else. But Lion Mountain mines were working at that time, right? In the 1840s, 50s? Well, around in that yeah, time, yeah. They think they started in the 30s or 40s, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't a big thing at the time. But I think 1842, there's some that's saying they were here to room and board the miners. And so some of this, like, there doesn't seem to be much documentation on it that I've ever located. 
I haven't been really into the newspapers of that time, but I know when the prison got started in 1845, this was the reason for it. Like uh, down in Auburn, they were using uh, mulberry trees with, the, and they were going to produce silk so that the prison in Auburn with silk, they would cover the cost of the prison. And, and I forget not just what they had in, uh, in Sing Sing. But denim ware was to be uh, iron ore. And this is where the name came in with uh, Sweden. And I ran across some of the things where it said uh, Smith Weed thought this would be the Sweden of America. And I imagine this is where the name came in mm -hmm. from Sweden, denim ore Sweden. Yeah. Today, communities that don't have a lot of labor, don't have a lot of work, they're trying to get prisons to give jobs to people. Right. And you're telling me 150 years ago, they were looking for jobs, but for the prisoners, not for the not for the guards. It, it was to, so they could be self-sufficient themselves. Correct. And that's how Denimora got here. That's how All we right. got here. They started out, to, and things have changed since then. And like I say, once we the state invested their money here, it was a desolate area, and there was no really the only way you get here, principally was walk. You could ride a horse uh, if you had a. Uh, wagon, uh, and then we had stagecoaches that would leave here at 8 o'clock in the morning and uh, wind up in Plattsburgh, I think, uh, 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And you swap back and forth. It, and that after they got the money invested here, they decided they had to do something better. Uh, and uh, the thing was transportation. You had a product here, the iron product. They produced uh, what they called empire nails, uh, principally. And they had to get at the prison. At the prison, this was. See, they had you had the whole thing up here, and I was running 24 hours a day. Uh, there, there uh, had people come in. Private concerns come in out of uh, Burlington, Chittenden, and these people come up here and develop for the state the necessary equipment. And then they got into had a big fire, and this all went down the drain. And state didn't, you know, dragging their feet. They. <laughs> didn't want to pay for what had been take had taken place, and they got into lawsuits, and, and eventually uh, there was other m things that were brought in here. But once you had the prison here, you had a problem of getting the people here, which weren't too many before the start of the prison, and you had to get the inmates in here. Many of them, in the beginning, walked from Plattsburgh up. And leg irons too. Leg irons had to be. Had Sure. And you could, some of them did come in on uh, lake vessels up to Ross's Point, took the Lake Champlain Transport, or Lake Champlain Agnesburg Railroad over to what we had the, was the uh, Denimora Crossing uh, on there, which was just south of uh, Vellenberg, on what we call the, uh, the uh, Plank Road. Okay. Uh, if we could show here, let me hold this for you here. Now, give us some landmarks and we'll know where we are, for instance. Well, here's Jay-Z Lake. Okay. So and here's... Uh, and Denimore will be down in here somewhere. Over here. Denimore is here. Let's see. And then this is up toward the Chateauguay. Yeah, here's Ellenberg Depot, right okay, there. Okay, Ellenberg Depot. Ellenberg Depot, right there. And then there. they had the Denimore... Denimore Crossing was right south of it. Here's the, here's the turnpike mm -hmm. running through here, 190. Okay. Just out here's... Was it Minor? And... This they the railroad came in here, of course, went back west. East west, that's the Rutland. Rutland mm -hmm. hooked, eventually become the Rutland Railroad. Mm -hmm. But that was the Denimora Crossing, and a lot of people, there was no railroad into Plattsburgh from the south. You could go f from Plattsburgh north up to Moore's Junction and into into um, Montreal. Mm -hmm. You go east to the west, but you couldn't go south out of Plattsburgh, and it was a no way. There was no way to go. D H didn't go south. No, at that time. Not until, not until they got involved later on with uh, Smith Weed, who was uh, quite an entrepreneur in the area, and Dr. Altina Waller put out a, a nice thing on him, and he had a lot to do with our area here in in this thing. He was, well, just like Senator Stafford uh, today, he was the real uh, entrepreneur for. Uh, the North Country, and he was involved in uh, railroading and iron entrepreneurship. He had a lot to do with 
really the development of it. And this whole thing probably enlightens as many people the story that you know, Dr. Waller produces here, how he got to Albany and he tried to get the state to appropriate the money for private investment in, in the field of railroads. Mm -hmm. Now, you, like I said here, then when the only way you were either getting out of Plattsburgh up here was uh, you rode a horseback or the, the, the uh, wagon. Right? The other way was come in off the north off here, off the Denimora Crossing. Crossing. And, and that route back through there, while well, a lot of people would look at it as and not being the best, uh, at least the, the level of that road down to... Is that the plank road today? Plank. That's the plank road we're talking about. Yeah. It comes out at Ledger's Corners Correct. between here and Line Mountain. And okay. the, only, the only problem you had was either coming up this side of the mountain or going back down the other side, which is about a mile and a third. We were on the road the other day going back after we left Line Mountain, and I remember Calvin's comment was, isn't this a straight road? It's as straight as an arrow. Shoots straight down. Separates Ellenburg, Altona, straight, and straight connects down. with Denimore. Yep. Yep. Town line. All right, we'll take a short break. We're talking with Terrence Gilroy. We're talking about uh, railroading in and around Denimore. And one more thing before we break is that He's mentioned uh, Smith Weed. Smith Weed. Huh? Uh, if you remember the other day, we talked about him a little bit when we were in Line Mountain because he was involved with the Chattagay Ore and Iron Company. He was one of the ones that uh, got that thing started, the mine started in Line Mountain. Uh, when you think of Plattsburgh, you think of the Weed Bridge, if you remember, next to the Legion. That yeah. must be named after this weed. And uh, some of the old um, books show his home in Plattsburgh, this right. uh, resident. He was a very prominent man. Correct. Be right back. So we're talking now in the 1850s, 1860 period when we're having these trouble getting the, the prisoners up here and uh, they had to walk and so forth from Plattsburgh. Yep. And they wanted to do some, there wasn't a real good road either, was there from here? No. no. How did you get to Line Mountain from here? Was there just a path there too? You went yeah, all over the mountain here. Uh, you didn't go what is now Route 374. You left, just left the village here at the, at the west end and went up by the state barn and you wound up at the top of the mountain and back down and around Chazy Lake. It's, yeah. it's 374 now, yeah. but I mean, it was just, yeah. uh, just a trail. Could the horses pull those uh, up there all right? It, been quite a pull. In the history of town of Ellenburg that Catholic Daughters put out was the first that I was able to locate definite proof that this happened, the Denimora Crossing. And it said in there that they had uh, used heavy wagons. Now the only thing was that uh, I would imagine they probably had more than a couple horses pulling these yeah. up or yeah. when it went down the other side to make sure that it didn't <laughs> get away from the big them. brakes. They had to have right. big brakes on the way. But they said big bike. I have never come up with any photos or other proof Nothing than like that. that. Yeah. But that's where they did at that time. And that's the only real problem of that north route as it was like with the railroad there was two routes considered a north route and a south route here when they decided to put the, the railroad in. That's out of Line Mountain originally, you mean? Yes. No, out of Plattsburgh. Plattsburgh. Okay. When they decided to come up from Plattsburgh. Yep. Smith Weed had his holdings in Line Mountain. Now, Smith Weed wanted uh, to develop that, and he decided, well, he'd get the state legislature to do it. Well, he got into a lot of political finagling, and the, the guy that was ahead of the Delaware and Hudson said, well, you know, if you could get them to build a railroad to Denimora, it's only a hop, skip, and jump from Denimora to Line Mountain. So that's what, what they, did. Yeah, they did. And you can see here in some of these things where they had the news article, people in, in the whole county were interested in getting this project going. As a matter of fact, one over here uh, said that, uh, and I'd like to read this, it said, the state appropriations uh, sufficient, but the right of way must be furnished free. Ah, State of New York. It was. wasn't going to buy any right away. <laughs> well, you, you can see probably where they applied the pressure because oh, sure. this, this, the prison is going to go out of here if we don't get this railroad from Plattsburgh up to Denimora. Now, the other thing is that there was a lot of uh, people who uh, trying to decide what route they're going to go, either the north route or the south route. And they're looking in many instances, and you have to laugh because some of it gets into 
localities, uh, and one locality is complaining about the other one because they don't have what we have over here, as an example, and some of these uh, where grist mills, saw mills, and that are, are of such importance that they, they should have that railroad run through their community rather than the, <laughs> than the other place. Now, it's very important to realize that where the train goes, that's where business goes. When you were settling the West, I remember I've been talking with people out in North Dakota, it, and they were planning, you know, they, had a, they had grist mills and different things, but now if the railroad decided not to head in that direction, but in this direction instead, they were out of business, they were out of existence. That town died. You had to have the railroad. That's what brought people, uh -huh. and I imagine the same thing, they wanted it in your backyard between here and Plattsburgh, huh? Well, yeah, the, you know, now you had another means to get back and forth to, to Plattsburgh. And not only that, there's some people who in here decided they would like to see this railroad once it was completed. One and one of them wanted to talk. Was talking about running it through up the Saranac River Valley, and then connecting it with Carthage, New York, and the Black River uh, Railroad over there, the Utica Black River Railroad, I think it was, and then even into Watertown. And there was some that who, after that was decided, they wanted to run this line back down here to the east, down around the mountain, up by Rand Hill, and over. And go into Chattagay. Uh, I, I don't see the reasoning for it because they already had the, the other railroad, the Lake Champlain Railroad. But you can see where they say, oh, what a beautiful view once you get over here mm -hmm. on the east end mm -hmm. of Rand Hill mm -hmm. when the, all of Lake Champlain, well, not all of it, but a good portion, and the Saranac River Valley are all opened. So they, these possibilities existed here. It's, it's quite, a, quite a thing when you, you uh, like this one here, the extension of, of the railroad June 29th. 1878, and the fact that the, the distance to Carthage, where we w would strike the Utica and Black River Road, also a road from Watertown, is about 130 miles from Plasburg, and they go on and develop this thing here. They also wanted one time, digressing here in a sense, was to run a railroad because of the closing of uh, the St. Lawrence River when it froze over. They were talking of running a covered railroad from Ogdensburg to Boston. Now, you know, a covered a covered bridge. Oh, a covered bridge. A ro uh, oh, yes, right. yeah. Yeah. all the way through that they the could snow. Yeah. But out could have it uh, open all year long. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I said, get some of these things you get into it, and you start to see mm -hmm. that how mm -hmm. these ideas spread up. Because as you mentioned, uh, what's his name? Our county uh, chamber of commerce president Gary Douglas talking about his in his book the development of the Erie Canal, transportation again, the Erie Canal developed, and what we have in New York, even today, after all these hundred years, or 160, 70 years, is based, because that went through, had they had another way, probably we wouldn't have a lot of the development in the state. And when the railroad was brought up here, in Line Mountain, we developed these areas of commerce to mm -hmm. the state. And like I say here, uh, what we have is a financial backup here in, New in Clinton County from the prison for 151 years. I don't know how many other places that have a better record in, in the county than we have. It is, it's important, I think, for the economy. We, we have these situations here, and all of these things combined make it possible. If you remember when we talked with Peg Barco about in our extensive coverage of railroads and the Rutland, the Rutland came through the northern tier about 1850. We're not too mm -hmm. far different from what we're talking about right now. And uh, one of the main reasons for that railroad to cross over at Rouse's Point and continue down to Boston was to bring cream and butter from uh, this dairy area to, to the Boston area. And they were able to do it by crossing the lake, got it there quickly, and then it was about 1875 when the D&H, instead of going from West Chazy to Moores, uh, started going over to Chazy and then hit Rouse's Point and became the, a real center between the Rutland, the, the CNN, the, the Canadian National, and the DNH, and all together in that one spot in Rouse's Point. Railroads in that time were very, very, very important. And if that hadn't have happened, this road, Denimora as a unit as we know it now would never have existed. It, wouldn't have, it would have ceased to exist probably, right? It would, it would have ceased to be, yes. The, the prison, and let's face it, Denimar built around the prison. 
You know, just like the mine, the mine mountain built around the mines. Yeah, that's the only reason it was here. Yeah. Did the state own very much land at that time, other than where the actual prison was located itself? Well, they they bought X number of acres when they started the place. I don't know just who they bought it from or who claimed title to the land. Mostly the north side of the main street, probably. Yeah. Okay. But see, they they bought when they come in and and surveyed the thing, then they brought. Uh, I don't know, how, as I said, don't know how many acres it was, and they also at that time appropriated money to build uh, 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 water rights on the Saranac River so that they could go down there and, and process the ore. Mm -hmm. But evidently it, it never, it, that portion never happened. Okay. We'll take another short break before we do, before it loses my train of thought here. Uh, when they built a new road up in and around the prison into Lion Mountain about the 1930s, mm -hmm. That road was used more for other than to get from here to Line Mountain by people from Plattsburgh uh, for a very special reason in the 40s and the 50s. Do you remember what people used that road for when you were buying a new car or a used car? They always said go to Denimore and try to make the Denimore Mountain. If it makes it makes the Denimore Mountain in high, you got a good car. It, cause it took. It was very tough. That was a tough. The right. toughest place to drive around here was up the Denimore Mountain. And they used to try out a lot of cars back then from Plattsburgh, and a lot of used cars made that hill. I remember I did in the late 40s. They said, go try it on Denimore Hill. We'll be right back. We're talking railroads. We're talking Denimore. We're talking a beautiful area, an area that uh, we're ready for snow any day. Shh. <laughs> we were talking a little bit off camera. We're talking about that period. And what some of the things that uh, Terence was telling us is not completely foreign to me because I, I, I like he like history. I don't delve in as much as he does, but recently obtained a copy, two copies of this Shazy Lake, fact, fiction, and folklore. It means that everything in here may not be exactly true, but they're stories. And uh, in here is a story about the Denimora Railroad tied in with the railroad era. Shazy Lake being between here and Line Mountain, and it ties right in, really. We're, we're very fortunate here within two days talking about Line Mountain, all of its problems, getting the ore out and everything else, and now talking about the Denimore Railroad because at that time, as you said, there were two choices. They had a choice to go north 17 miles to Chattagay and hit the railroad, or come this way 17 miles, but this way was much harder terrain. It, it wasn't flat, it wasn't straight. In either case, not only was it good for the taking the ore out, but it also made a place to bring tourists in and the prisoners and it kept your, your thing going here. Uh, at the same time, it said way back here in the Denimore prison opened in 1845, for years, it was necessary to transport all supplies, fuel, men, we, we weren't talking about fuel, over a crude road 20 miles from Plattsburgh. In addition, the business of making iron at Denimore Prison had also provided, proved disastrous for the iron ore deposits at the prison were inferior quality. This led to idle prisoners, and the prison seemed doomed unless a railroad was connected to connected with civilization. <laughs> it wasn't considered very civilized up here. You, it, it was tough to get out. At the same time, Smith, Weed, and Williams realized they needed a railroad to transport their iron ore from Line Mountain. They offered to grade and furnish the ties from the mines to Chattagay Station, Chattagay, New York, if the OL and CR, that's the Augensburg and Lake Champlain Railroad, would lay the rails and operate the road, and they said no, they declined. Desperately needing rail transportation, Weed used his influence, as you said, in the legislature uh, to introduce a bill to construct a railroad from Denimore to Plattsburgh. After a great struggle, this bill was passed, authorizing the building of the Denimore Plattsburgh Railroad. There was a strong sentiment against the state constructing and operating a railroad. The amount appropriated was a mere $80,000. This, however, was better than nothing, as the road would save the prison from abandonment and also provide a market for the rich resources of Line Mountain. Well, there was a lot of opposition at that time by the labor unions as using inmates to compete against them. They wanted 
their own people to do the work. And this, the one of the reasons in the very beginning of the prison, they wanted to prevent the overlapping of this. And that's why we got into mining iron ore, because at that time it was imported. And it was mainly to save labor for people who were not prisoners, right? The kind and who were the laborers who built this prison? They were the, the we didn't, uh, well, there was the first draft come in uh, in June of 1845. There were local people who did the original building of the prison until the inmates got here. I think they were out of Saranac, as I remember, somebody from Saranac was in charge of the building of the buildings and that stuff up to that certain point. Then when the inmates come in, uh, let's say uh, four months afterwards, and then they took over and they built their own prison. They built their own the, places. Just right? about the inmate. Yeah. The contract to lay the railroads awarded to a John O'Brien, who knew it would be difficult to break even. To keep costs at a minimum, the contour of the ground was frequently followed, resulting in many curves and rises, like the old roads, if you'll notice. You went wherever the cow's paths had been, because you didn't try to fight the hills or remove right. all that dirt. Uh, the little railroad, known as plattsburgh Denimore Railroad, was completed in 1878 and equipped the following year. A earlier extensive and rich iron ore deposits had been discovered at Lion Mountain about 18 miles west of Denimora. The Shattagay Ore Company, who owned the property, had been transporting their ore by wagons. Now you can imagine uh, uh, just a, a, a horse and buggy over this mountain and get into, they had to get to a railroad somewhere or, or, or a water where they could transport their ore out. Uh, the operation was tedious and expensive. The developers realized they would have to secure rail connections with the great iron-making centers if they were to fully develop the rich resources at Line Mountain. The question was which way to go. Two routes were open, down the Chattagay Valley to Chattagay, the other east to Denimora, with a connection to the new state-owned plattsburgh Denimora line. So at that time, they were talking about this, Denimora line was, was set in here at that time, right? The... Chattagay route ran 17 miles along a straight line with an even grade, while Denimora was 17 miles long from there to Denimora, but lay through solid wilderness, a crooked line running around two mountains. So we're saying this wasn't built for Line Mountain originally. They were building, at least it might have been in the back of somebody's mind that they were going to go on to Line Mountain, Smith Weed, because right. Smith Weed's the one that owned the place up there, right? Correct. Right. And he also was the one that wanted to get a, a railroad as far as Denimora. Then he could f just see himself making money and getting on to the D&H. And he had a buddy. Now, uh, the logical choice was Chattagay. But Thomas Dickerson, the president of D&H, close friend of Smith Weed, one of the promoters, concluded that the proper route was via Denimora to Plattsburgh, where it could then go to market on D&H railroad rails. And they could make some money. So on May 15, 1879, the Chattagay Railroad was organized with Dixon as president. Five days later, they secured a 100-year lease for the plattsburgh Denimora line. Now, the narrow gauge, grading began on the new line, the narrow gauge of three feet was used to minimize the cost of the line. What are we talking about, narrow gauge? Well, there, there's two, the standard gauge and the narrow gauge, and this the narrow gauge was, at that time, considered the best, but later on they decided that the uh, regular would, four, that was four feet, eight and a half feet. Okay, we're not talking the size of the rails, we're talking the distance between, between the right. two rails. Now you remember, four, four feet eight, you know if you look at one of your uh, panels here, they were right. four feet, a little wider than that, contrast to, to three feet. You also got to remember with three feet you had a lot less steadiness, yeah. right? But it cost less because you didn't have to have so long a rails. You didn't need such a, uh, probably your train wasn't as wide either, probably higher and... Uh, that, I, I don't know, have anything on what that would have consisted of, no. I'm but you sure. said, now we were talking before, that uh, when this rail got from Dine Mountain to Plattsburgh, there's no way they could take that car and put it on the D&H to go, to, to go south because it wouldn't fit the track. They had a dumping station down there where they came in and it went over the other railroad and they dumped the car from this onto the other line. 
Sorry, where they that had the wide right. gauge, standard gauge. Standard gauge. Most of the United States has regulated years ago, except for individually owned like this, where trains could, one car, you know, years ago, I guess they used to switch things from car to car. When you went from one railroad to the other, and they, someone said, hey, why are we doing this? Why don't we just lease the car from our railroad, and we'll just switch it to the other railroad, go from Rutland to the D&H, and let's not change the merchandise. Just take the train off ours, let them use it, and the next thing you know, it's in California someplace. It's all over the world, uh, these various cars that belong to various railroads. And it was a, a train to be made up of all kinds of cars from all kinds of different... Okay. Uh, construction continued through the summer until labor problems resulted. Uh, prompt arrest of 11 ringleaders at the Knoll House near Shazy Lake put an end to the strike. Some of the strikers returned to work while others returned to Canada. By October 4th, 1879, the entire line through the woods from Lion Mountain to Denimore was completed. The total length of the narrow gauge was 49 miles. Now that included some uh, that included branches and side tracks. Beginning in Plattsburgh, it ran south of the Saranac River, crossing over a picturesque gorge, surrounded by the Adirondack Peaks and the Vermont Hills in the distance. The train that turns northward and plunges it then plunges into the wilderness, reaching the head of Shazy Lake, nestled in the shadow of Line Mountain. It then continued to Line Mountain, also known as Rogers Field and terminated in Williamstown, later known as Standish. The total cost of the railroad, everything, was $384,817, and they had only been granted 80000 if you remember. Okay. Well, I, I think that one of the things here, when we're talking about Smith Weed and, and, and Dickinson and these people, he, uh, Smith Weed wanted to run the railroad south out of Plattsburgh. They had the run north out of Plattsburgh, as I said earlier, to the Morris Junction. But, and, and uh, what's the name we mentioned here earlier uh, that did the work? Dickinson? Oh, O'Brien? O'Brien. O'Brien had worked previously down around, I think, Port Henry in that area, and he had uh, worked for these people in constructing the road. And he made a deal with the uh, superintendent of prisons that they would build this road here if they could have sufficient inmates to do the first two miles of grading east from Denimora. And there was opposition to this, of course, in the state allowing state taxpayers' money to go into a private industry of running this line up through here. And as I said, Smith Weed had in the back of his mind that because Dickinson had told him that once they could get the railroad to the prison, then they could hop, skip, and jump into Line Mountain and get the ore out of there. So there was a lot of finagling going on with Smithweed and these people to the south because as is today we are just one of a number of people and we don't really hold that kind of uh, political savvy in, in Albany. Smithweed was a, an individual who worked all angles to make sure he got his thing. The only thing was is, as Dr. Waller points out it wound up and defeated him in the end because the DNH then <laughs> kicked Smith Weed out of business because they had what they wanted and they got rid of them. Okay, the you you got to remember you're talking a hundred and seventeen years ago. You know this is a, we're second way back. One more thing: the railroad gave tourists access to Line Mountain and Shazy Lake, and this beckoned the tourists to the tranquil slopes of Line Mountain and the serene waters of Shazy Lake. This was virgin lake territory up here. And what a beautiful spot that people could come out of the cities. Uh, there was a book called The Railroad Stations of the Adirondack, and it said that Shazy Lake is a station stop for summer camps on the lake of the same name, a few scattered permanent residents, many of whom are caretakers of summer camps. Um, and the residents, a lot of people from the cities came up here and uh, uh, if you don't have this book, by the way, Kathleen King, Judith LaPointe, and, and uh, Don Jackson, Don Jackson it, it's ten dollars. Uh, you can get it from either one of those people. That's Mrs. Frank Lapo uh, uh, King, and I forget which Mrs. LaPointe, Judy, Judy uh, and you can get this book and uh, it's available. And uh, they printed up 2,000 copies. 
I happen to have number 425, and I also have number 210. Uh, it's a great book. It's a lot of names, lots of people. My pictures of my uncle are in here, and people around the Shazy Lake area. We're in Denimara, and, that's where, and we're, we're, we're partial to Denimara today, but we wanted to bring this in to show you how this all tied in. And in the background, Smith Weed, wanting to get to Denimara, was thinking of his own place, otherwise you not, would not have had this. Uh, we're talking with Terence Gilroy. Cal Calvin Castine has the camera. Uh, I'm Bob Venn, and we'll all be back shortly. Ooh. Oh, the dual gauge. Okay. Talking about narrow gauge, and uh, this is a book on railroads and things, and Terence found, explain what we got here in the middle is the narrow gauge. Correct. Three, Three. feet between the row, you know, the others are the cross ties. Yeah. And then they're usually about seven feet on standard, seven to eight feet across. These are probably five to six. And down below is even a more interesting because it has a combination. The two outside is the standard, and the two on the left would be the, uh, the <laughs> narrow gauge. That's very, very interesting. If you remember, the closest we've ever come to this was when we were talking with Peg Barcombe about the Rutland crossing. There were two railroads that crossed that bridge. Mm -hmm. And so they wouldn't use each other's tracks. There were four sets of rails. There were two here and two here. So you use an outside and an inside either way. And each one kept their own tracks and they maintained the bottom and all the rail, uh, the uh, cross ties jointly, but each had their own rails. And they ran, uh, uh, that was it. Was it? I have, never, have you ever seen this anywhere? No. I have never seen that anywhere. Never even heard of this. That's why in Europe there are many different gauges and uh, a lot of trains can't go. One of the reasons for having different gauges is that they must use your, your cars. Correct. They have to transfer onto yours, see? Change it. Yep. This, this is called, Where Did the Tracks Go? What is this book about? It's, it's from a professor at uh, Paul Smith's and he did a lot of the railroads in the North Country. There's diagrams in here and, so and a, maps and the, of the of the whole thing. There were a lot of short railroad. Uh, yes. Uh, right. Up and down the D and H, yep. and through the central ladder and access as they had. I think I, even after this railroad closed uh, from or after it officially closed from here to Line Mountain, didn't they still have some uh, joy rides or rides with? No, they didn't. No. I remember Ralph, Ralph Gilpin told me how he used to uh, ride that. I think. And, and you could could you ever go from Line Mountain to uh, Lake Placid and beyond? Did they ever do anything? Well, you could you could go and then at Paul Smith, I think it was hooked on to the Utica line, the New York huh? Central. They went up through Malone and into Montreal. Because it wasn't too many years ago, or my wife's mother uh, would take. We, she'd come up. They lived in the Utica area. Come out of Utica up to uh, Saranac Lake, and we go pick her up, and then. Our kids there, when they were small, take them up to Saranac Lake and put them on a train, and mm -hmm. they'd go down to Utica and they'd pick them up down there. So there was a an, a good distance, you know, between the two. But yet the the, the transportation problem was solved with with this whole uh, situation in the railroad. And this is probably like most of it. He's got Doctor uh, Kurt Ditto or Professor Kurt uh, of all of the lines, more or less in the, in the uh, North Country here, all the way from. Warrensburg on mm -hmm. up and all the way down here to Remsen and into the Utica area. Of course, they run that line now out of Old Forge. Uh, See all the small railroad. Here's the one we were talking, where we've been talking about, from Plattsburgh, just yeah. south of Plattsburgh, uh, down along underneath, uh, south of Denimora, makes the curve, it hits Shazy Lake in here, and then Lion Mountain. On Chayota, Serenade. Oh, I guess a bigger part. This is Lion Mountain, and yeah. Shazy Lake is in the big curve there. Yeah. Bends around. 49 Chayota. miles, including. The, the spurs that they had in and out. Uh, I, and I thought from Line Mountain it probably went south to uh, Standish along the way, it must have, because that's where they did their smelting yeah. and things. Now, after this got started then, in 1879, they had their first trip coming through. But where did your studies take you from there? Well, I, I haven't gotten really into that other than, you know, what the meeting they had here in Plattsburgh to, to get all of this online. Okay. So you've got to fill in uh, in and around getting it and, and <coughs> settling all these arguments to make right. sure that who's going to do it, who's going to... And you know how they bought the land if the state said we're not going to buy the land between the right of ways, you're going to have to do that yourself. 
So there was a group here in Plattsburgh or Denimore that had to do that. I don't know how what they developed here, whether Smith Weed or these people got together and, and got together to uh, make a um, company out of this, because some of this does list people who were on these committees to see about this building of the railroad and, and maintaining it. And with Smith Weed, uh, I don't have that ability okay. to tell you. Do you know when it closed? Did it close when the mines closed in 67? Yeah. Uh, Shortly thereafter, probably? Yeah, there was a, a thing here when the last okay. train down. You no longer needed it for your prisoners and your exchanges and your fuel. You then had your 374, which was a good route coming up. Or was it route th three, route th 374. 374 was a good route coming up, and that probably in the 20s. And you got a lot more vehicular, tra vehicular traffic. You didn't have that in the 1880s. Horse and buggy, or you had a train, and train were the big things. Well, it was easy to go from, from station to station, as they say. Um, I had it here someplace. I can't just pick it okay. up. Okay. Now, you got some pictures here. You've got an early station and a later station. Is this the... The first station, when they come up... Uh, this, this it here? That's the second one, oh. which is the village the first office. One, is that the first? No, they're both the same. Okay. This was the second station. Built in 1912. Now, this is an old postcard, and we wanted you to know why they called them penny postcards, because the postage was one penny. That's the second part that's interesting in this. The third part, and to us as interesting as anything, is this is addressed to Mrs. William Lattrimore in Shazy, New York. Probably someone writing about insurance. <laughs> the Latrimore's Insurance in Shazy, one of the proud sponsors of uh, Hometown Cable, an advertiser of the whole Latrimore family. This is a postcard written about between 1912 and 1915, this one here you think. We don't know for sure. I can't quite read the date. Yeah. Uh, but it was written in July. Uh, can't quite read it. And then here's another picture of the same station. That was... That postcard says 1912. Yes. Now, it's, it's surprising you'd wonder how this card got back to Denimora because it was written to Mrs. Tierney in Detroit, Michigan. If you want to get cards of your area, you collect cards. You can't find them in your area because you didn't send cards to your own area. You sent them outside the area, right? Right. right. If you want cards of Detroit, you find them in Denimora. So somewhere along the line, someone traveling and, or at a show somewhere, uh, checking, found this denim or a car. You don't remember where you got this? No. Sometimes they mark on there who gives them to me. Yeah. But I didn't the interesting know. part I is that I it. still like today, see? Sends a nice picture, and you, uh, there's your address, and three little words, we'll write soon. <laughs> <laughs> but they know they're thinking about them. Well, well still a lot for a penny. <laughs> yeah, July 1912. <laughs> you place your stamp right there. Uh, Beautiful picture. Just another picture of a the same, same station. Yeah. Where was the station here in Denimar? It's right over here, right west of the Catholic Church. West. So that in order to get there, you'd go all the way up past the prison and turn left next to the bank. Is that the way you get down yeah, to the station? Down. On the Saranac Road. On the way to the Saranac. Okay. Is it what's it being used for today? Village, Village office. It is. Make a nice office, huh? Yeah. They, Del Delaware and Hudson gave us that. They did. They donate to the village. You know, the D&H and station, of course, is still in Rouse's Point, not being used very much, going to, to disrepair very, very quickly. A very attractive station with the big round uh, point on it on the end, and it's, it's quickly going. They've asked to see if we could get it, make a great historian's office, you know, yeah. uh, and anything with railroad. Now, some of the, of course, it says D&H station, so somewhere along the line it went from the Denimore Railroad to become a D&H station, huh? Yeah. Became known as D&H. Okay. I don't know. It's when Mr. Wheat took over. And this is also a Delaware and Hudson, so it says yeah. Delaware starting here. With the village office in the background, which at that time was the, uh, you can see over here, yeah. this is the village office now. At that, well, this is the railroad station. Because when they brought the inmates in here after the railroad come in, they brought the inmates up from Plattsburgh on the railroad all the way. Before that, they were transporting them 
down below you had a various situation where from railroad to railroad and then they would have to get off and take uh, lake uh, transportation. Sometimes they took, brought him into uh, Keysville or Port Douglas and other times they brought him into Plattsburgh and also into Ross's Point. Did there, there had to have come a time where they went from narrow to standard gate, Nine, correct? 1903 I think it was. Okay, it did, they did change from the narrow gauge, three feet to four feet eight, uh, along the way, 19. So I mean, they had to lay all new ties because the ties are wider. There are various ties, and th I think Oral Parsons and Peg Barcombe, for the knowledge I have about railroads, you have regular uh, cross ties, and then you have, uh, <laughs> I wish I could remember it, I forgot it, the big ties, switch ties. Those were 15 feet long. That's where you had trains going both directions and you were in your, your switching trains. And those are much, much wider and bigger. And those were called switch ties. And I, I think most of my knowledge about railroads, think, and, and of course Larry Marnes. Larry Marnes also. Three people that taught me about railroads over the years and, and, and I appreciate it and I've enjoyed it every, every bit. We enjoy talking with people. Terrence, uh, our third time. We can't really count the second time because it was just a, a little talk in front of the mine contonement, but the first time talking about his uh, hobby with the military people and now with the railroads. We'll take another short break. Uh, we're in lovely Denimar on a great day. And it's a, it's a Monday and it's great to be alive. Summer timetable of the train leaving Denimar and going east, going west. So there was a lot of business. It's going great. east three times a day. Yep, three times a day. I remember going to Plattsburgh any number of times and coming back with the train, especially during the winter time when so the roads you were rode cold. the train. You're saying, yeah. Remember the how much it cost you to ride the train? Remember any idea? Dad pay for it. Dad would pay for it. <laughs> but uh, you, uh, it, it was a regular schedule, so you'd go in. You could do what you want to do in Plattsburgh, go back to the station, and come home, right? Right. And when you were saying this, you're talking about when you were a teenager. After that, or earlier? Oh, seven years of age. Nice. Seven. Yeah. You'd go to Plattsburgh by oh, yourself? Oh, sure. Because, well, when the roads were closed in the winter, that was the only way you'd go down. And yeah. Go down to Plattsburgh's shop, and we'd stay with my aunt and uncle. Yeah. Down there on Macomb Street. Mm -hmm. And it went west, 740, 105, and 646, except Sunday. Sunday you had less, probably, huh? Yeah. I, I wrote also I mean, when we did the church history how the railroad ran behind the church here. Mm hmm and they sometimes would put the train there across the road to Saranac and then switch cars and stuff and people were waiting to get to church or getting to go home from church and here they were running up and down the tracks with the railroad mm -hmm. and not only that was a vibration uh, in that you could feel in the church with with the glasses and things shaking when that big thing ro rode up and down the track or the individual there was a sermon being given and all of a sudden the engineer not knowing that he would give a blast on that whistle that didn't <laughs> put the point across that you're you know <laughs> now the picture that we saw in the back of that book indicated that it might have come in a little south of Plattsburgh rather than right into the main station did it go right into the main station it went off the north end of the uh, post the military okay barrier. up there all right yeah and in some of these things here were that all of the, the roads that they all said well they ought to at the north end of, of the uh, what would they call it well the, the barracks and then split from there whether they went up through on a, on a north route uh, let's say the West Plattsburgh or whether they mm -hmm. went through Schuyler Falls on the south route but they all come into Katyville and then up the hill to Denimora. Mm -hmm. Picture here of the railroad, it's very difficult to see. I'm afraid, but the the train is right in here. You've got some steam coming out. You've got the sky and you've got the snow, so it's it's a very difficult picture. But you can see this was taken down right here, here, right here in Denmark, west, west of the west, west of, of the, the village office, of which was a. This is a the regular run of train. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't the ore bearing trains that come down from from Lime Mountain. When you rode this train. When you went to Plattsburgh, was it only passengers? Mm -hmm. Only passengers. Passengers and mail. And mail. Were there many cars? Two, three, four cars? No, there weren't that many cars. That many, was pretty well was patronized, pretty well used? Yeah, I think. Okay. I don't have a re yeah. you know a number of readers. There was only one track. Right. You didn't have a track to pass. You might have had a 
place to swing off any place where you could m meet another one? You know, like in, well, there was in that book where the yeah. other stations were, where you had some here when they built the powerhouse in 1929. Then they had to put an extra spur in to accommodate to the, the bringing up of coal mm -hmm. to run this, the thing. And they had some on on the north side where they stored uh, extra cars. And uh, that one of those photos showed the water tower where they could come in there and get water for the engine. You remember when that train went by? Were there any much wood carried, pulp wood? I don't ever don't remember seeing wood. No, at all. either either transportation for or riders or, or, or the ore trains. The ore train. All right. Now we are up to 1912. And is there anything else you want to talk about as far as uh, anything more about the station or about the train here? Any, any antidotes you've heard about the train or anything along the way? Well, I guess they just had the normal problems with the trains they were once in a while getting loose going downgrade to Katyville and had a couple accidents with them. Go off the track? Yeah, went off the track with the narrow gauge. They didn't have that much of a problem really uprighting the trains again. Mm -hmm. The only one I remember it, also with that was kids here going back through to uh, Shazy Lake and Lime Mountain uh, like a lot of places decided to take the train up in the summertime and they're going to go swimming Shazy Lake and Slipped and went under the thing, lost his leg. Uh, yeah. Eddie yeah. Lamountain never. And those are the things kids mm -hmm. do. But I mean, oh yes, yeah, kids do. Do you remember the snow plows or anything in front of the? Not, not that I can remember. Do you know what a cow catcher is? Yep. You know, tell us what a cow catcher is. It's your interpretation of a cow catcher, because we heard that from Peg as we were yeah. talking about the railroad. You know, I don't know if we can see one here or not. No, they don't see one here anywhere. Well, there was. There were some stories here that some of the cows died in the field, which was close to the track, and then hauled over the line, and, mm -hmm. then, and then asked the railroad to pay for them. Oh yeah, but <laughs> I'm not going to mention names. No, no, no. But <laughs> I that, don't have a good lawyer. But that fork thing in right. front, which I used to think was for the uh, uh, like snow removal, it, it was if there's cows on the track that that, that got hit or something, it would shove them off, right? Correct. Instead of running over them. It was uh, uh, th Yep, they're not on here. All right. Uh, any other stories you can think of? Any other uh, memories of yourself? I think we've covered this pretty well. Okay. Now let's start off. You'll take we've got another three, four minutes before we take a break. This stuff does not is not mailed to you. You don't get a book, a magic book, with all this information that you've gathered. You've done a lot of legwork for nearly five years, I think you said, right? How do you go about researching when you want to talk about the Denimora Railroad? Well, you got to have a, a date more or less to start with. If mm -hmm. you know when this was online, you can pick it up from some other publication. Well, like, for instance, you could find some yep. here, yep. and then you've got to embellish, of course, yep. right? So you've got dates in uh, here, you've got names, right? You get, a, you get a date from that and then you can go down and right here I think we were quite lucky in the city library in Plattsburgh and up at the college you can go in and find out the publications that have been printed over the years here in, in the county and they're all numbered and the dates are on there and you can go over to, and uh, they got them in the files take them out of the file, a nice box, and the date's on there, like C21, let's say. Well, that'd be the Plattsburgh Republican. Uh, October 21st of 1874 through to, uh, let's say, June 26th of 1890. Uh, the thing was, that in, in most cases like that, they'd probably have the newspaper only printed on Saturdays. So you always have, Then you'd, you'd take that out, and you have a choice of two ways to go. Uh, they got the readers where you put the film in and you can just about scan the whole page. You just get the page on there and then you can see what you want. Well, what I used to do was I'd mark these down as to the page and the date and what the article was. And then I'd go through that whole roll of film. Then when I had finished, I would take that same roll back and go into the other uh, one where you can make a copy of it. Now I know where it is and I don't have to reread that newspaper the second time. I go by the date and page, run down, make a mm -hmm. copy, and then I come back and stick them in here in a, in a numerical way so that we know continuity 
right. where, the, where this will be. Now, explaining now with this roll of microfish you have, right? Microfish, microfish film. Uh, you find the page you want, and there's this area. And then there's a machine that you just put your quarter or 15 cents or whatever and push a button, and it will photograph that portion you're looking at. Uh, the upper left, the lower right, it won't do the whole page. Uh, sometimes you have to get, you can't do all that at once, right? Oh, no. No, they just give you maybe a little area, you know. So you may take you two or three. And this is what it, it looks like that you probably then put some together and made a photostat, right? This right. Is the photostat and not the, the original. Paint. So various things, and of course, some of them, are, when, even when you those readers, they're very hard to read uh, because uh, they, they're blurry a little bit, and you keep moving them in and out, move left to right. Yeah. You can adjust them as, as to the, uh, like, if you want to just, these are about the size of the columns yep. themselves, you, and you can either blow them up if, if it gets too small and you can't read it to that mm -hmm. degree, enlarge it, it but it, it also it makes the, the film that much Worse in a sense. Yeah. You've got to remember that the old papers, there were more, the columns were wider than they are today. They were wider columns. And the, uh, the, so, so then you have that, and then you have, you see the other various. These ones. that blew up. Those are blown. Enlarged. And uh, you see now here's something that you may have typed some I've of it. Type that up. See, some of it, instead of paying a quarter, you can write it out and, and you're only going to get one or two lines. But just imagine. That you want to find, they tell you that the birth of your grandfather is in the Plattsburgh Press Republican, and you could go find it, but you don't know whether he was born somewhere between 1890 and 1899. It means you got to go through every paper, right, mm -hmm. every sheet until you find the births, and they weren't always on the same page. Sometimes they would have, have it in two different places in the paper. And you're looking for only one thing. He's looking nearly every square inch in that paper. It, it may be a death got hit by a car, and it says something about he was in, uh, an organizer in the railroad. Could be right. So you might want that because it, it might add to what you got. And he's got some very interesting. Tell us about the guy here who was uh, and and uh, and know what the one about the uh, the clothesline, and, and he deserved every bit of it. Uh, is, is this the one right there? No. Uh, he, he deserved every bit of it. We're talking here 116 years ago, too. And, and he had one, because you don't only copy with the railroad, you, you might pick up other things. One of the things he picked up was um, teachers in the county in 1878. So he copied all the names that might have been in Denham or Line Mountain that would be in his area that he's a historian. It, it might be something you'd want to do sometime. Uh, there's a marriage. What, what's the marriage you got in? Is that something well, else, or is that? Yeah, the marriage. And I it's just for the town records, up. right? Yeah. Yeah. The, well, because there's a listing here from Denimore, and Denimore on May first, eighteen seventy-eight, by Reverend W. A. Miller, Millard S. Snell, and Nellie C. Conger, both of Cadyville, New York. But also in here, there is one in uh, Ellenburg on May seventh. Uh, and also one in Plattsburgh at St. Peter's Church. Father Gaudet is marrying Theophile Teru and Agnes Massey. You see, there are two places. One is the city library. There's also, excuse me, the special collection that the Feinberg Library it has a lot of the old uh, papers that you can get this information from. And... Uh, Although this library don't want you just going to browse, this is not that kind of a library. You, if you've got a project, fine. But the public library, just about anybody can go in there and 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 see. Uh, th this is special. They don't want 300 people in there a day. Yeah, it's not for that purpose. And these are very valuable old records. All McClellan's records from uh, Champlain are down in that area. Uh, one other thing we might mention before we take the break is that I'm sure that all of you who are watching, and there are many of you, don't live in Denimore because we don't get it in Denimore. You're not here. However, you may have something in your possession that has to do with the Denimore area, be it an old map, uh, an old article out of the paper that don't mean much to you, or you could at least make a copy. You'd be very pleased to receive yep. things like that because he ha is the town historian and keeps this kind of thing, and he don't even know it exists, so he can't go ask for it. 
You don't know enough to look for it. You didn't know it happened. Correct. It could be anything. It could have been a car, uh, a wreck of the train uh, uh, with a, a car, nobody in the train, but in the car was the former supervisor. And you'd like to have that in your records. Correct. So that if you have anything at all in the town of the town of Denimore, right? The village. The village. You're the village. Uh, or anything at all that you think you might be interested in. It's Terrence Gilroy, Smith Street, yep. Denimore, New York. Uh, he'd be glad to get it or even give him a call and... Uh, you can give him a copy or something, and he'd be glad to hear it if you don't want to uh, be separated from it. You could maybe loan it to him and make you, did they say, this your article? Okay. Go read right. the article. This well, is a little sidelight. One of those funny things you find in here, in, it says here, in the criminal court cases, causes were disposed of. June 22nd, 1878, Joseph, whatever, indicted for robbing a clothesline, was tried and found guilty and sentenced to five years imprisonment <laughs> in Clinton prison at hard labor being the full extent of the law he is a bad man and deserved this sentence <laughs> that's something to just that little conversation piece you know and we, and historians and others who get records will find this type of thing and if you're doing a genealogy you also find these odd things at times <laughs> my aunt told me she said don't look any further. You're, you might find a horse thief in your family. Well, so be it. I can't change it, right? Yeah. Be nice to know it. Yeah. I could rub in. I could rub it into his clothes relatives. <laughs> we'll be right back. You're watching Hometown Cable. What's going on here is the name of the program. I'm Bob Venn. That's Calvin Castine, and this learned gentleman here, very interested in history and uh, particularly around Denimore, is Terence Gilroy. Today is the twenty-third of September 1996. You've been working on this for five years. Right. What are you going to do with it? You get it when you, how are you going to know you're done when you're done? You're never done. You're never done. No. So you just I, continue. You just go from okay. one thing to another. You're not going to just keep this in a loose leaf. Are you going to uh, tend to put some kind of a book together or some kind of a thing here for the town? Or what are you going to do? Well, I like to put them in, in some kind of a uh, numerical sequence. Mm -hmm. And like I said, my first one I did on things was from 1844 to 1864. Mm -hmm. These are articles relative to the village life. And then I will go on and continue to that point where, as I do today, these books over here, I do it now year by year of the newspaper articles. Mm -hmm. But that way there, I bring them over and I leave them at the village office so that they have a copy. The only thing is, like you mentioned, indexing them. If the people, if they're indexed, and we have some of them that are, and an individual can come down and find where that is, it is still a lot easier to go over there and locate it. Even some of them may not be indexed, they can at least look through six books and come up with this, uh, let's say, of uh, 600 pages where you're going to go down through the library and not know where you're looking and spend, oh, probably uh, 30 hours of research for a year of newspaper. That's right. Do you intend to ever do anything like this with it? Put it in a form like this? Not really, no. Have you ever made a book like this? We did one, yep. You, oh, I got that, of course. The Village Den of Denimore. Yes, I got that. You also had a nice uh, calendar. Did, were you involved in that calendar of Denimore? All the nice pictures? That was last year for the yes. sesquicentennial yep. of the prison. Yes. That's very nice. I got one of those. Yep. That's, that's excellent. And I got one of those when I heard about the book. I got my, my money in the mail right away. It was only $4 or something. Yeah. And I wish I'd have got two or three of them. But uh, yes. Uh, the question is this one. And the latest question in our area that you're watching is called the Living Stone. And that's the story of the Cooperville Church and the Cooperville area by none other than our own Suzanne Shan. Brown Moore, Mrs. Uh, Brian Moore from Cooperville. Um, took her a while to get that together and, uh, and some people were a little upset that it wasn't coming, but let me tell you, if you read that book and see what she's done, you'd wonder how she got it done in the time allotted. She worked in that by herself and did a tremendous, tremendous job. And we thank Shan for that. And all of these books, uh, you take your time, they'll be in libraries, read them, uh, find out there's a lot of information and if you see any of these people that worked on these books. Thank them for all their time. They don't get paid for any of their time, like you don't get paid for yours. Oh, no. Who I'm was not. the historian before you? Ken Boise. How long ago? Well, he was in three or four years, I think, Ken was. As a matter of fact, I dedicated the 
history book that we wrote on Denim War to okay. him because he kind of inspired me to. So you've been historian three or four years? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Twenty-five. Yeah. A lot of W two forms with zero 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 on them. But <laughs> are you are you as interested now as you were when you started? More, uh, more. Yeah. Are you in, is, as you as enthusiastic? Yeah. Ah, but are you as good? Well, that's debatable. <laughs> Your age has got a lot of experience. <laughs> I have uh, this year over two hundred hours of research since yeah. we come back in in May. Uh, just because of the increase in this and, and trying to do these things yep. here. And the thing is that sometimes you get onto the one thing yep. and then somebody comes in with something else and wants you to mm -hmm. lean there. So you try to divide your time to see what you can do to accommodate them. Let's say one thing. If you're not interested, don't ever get involved. If you want to be a, a historian 100%, don't become involved at all because it takes 100% of your efforts, right? Wow. And, and uh, uh, a good historian who likes what they're doing and does what they should be doing, and I can name several, I hesitate, but I, uh, there are people, uh, Champlain right now, we are just in a state of exchange there. Uh, you take Donna Boyle, who's been working for years in Rouse's Point, John Ross mm -hmm. before her, yeah. let's not forget Peg Barcombe, and of course right now, Celine. one of the, Celine Paquette, one of the most thorough enjoyable uh, offices of the historian you can go into is in Shazy, New York. Marie Gannett, uh, I'm not saying she did all the work, she was, she followed Nell Sullivan who did a great job. They're, they're organizing it very well, she's very dedicated and they've got a tremendous place to display it and she and her husband Leon are doing an excellent job and we thank them for it and we thank all the historians. Uh, I know Moore's is relatively new, uh, I don't even know if they have an office or if she's doing it, doing it at home. Yours is at home, right? Right. You know, it's, it's been nice to have a little space you can leave and go and you dedicate all your time. Anything else that we should talk with Terrence Gilroy about? Nothing I can How do we thank Terrence Gilroy for today and other times? Well, I want to thank you. <laughs> That's the thing because without your ability to get this message out and encourage these people to do these things and find out what has happened in the past, mine is only here. Mm -hmm. And what we can do with this is, is transportation was mm -hmm. important. Then the message that we, we can produce to these people to go down and do it. And you'd be interested, I find my great-grandfather uh, who died in about 1876 up in Black Brook. I've never really located much beyond him. I do know that his father was born over in North Hero about 1820. I have spent more time doing my research than I should wanted to do in the family, but there it is, it's listed there when you find it. And, oh, mm -hmm. good Lord. Yeah. I was just told the other day that there's a new census now. The old census is now a, in a copy available for Grand Isle County mm -hmm. in Alberg and so forth over there in Vermont. I, I heard that and that, that's available. Uh, when you talk about bringing this message, of course it's, it's Hometown Cable, Calvin and Sam and Hometown Cable that brings all of this, puts in all the effort, uh, spends all the money. I spend a little bit of time I've got time and there's nothing I enjoy more than meeting people like you, talking about things of interest. This is even very interesting. They're all interesting to me because yeah. I'm learning every day. But this is even more interesting because some of the things you talked about I've read and I know that uh, how dedicated you are as a historian and we thank you for your time and we thank you for all your efforts for these people and for all who were, ever look up your records. Thank you. Okay. And thank you for watching Hometown Cable and don't, in closing, don't want to belabor it, but become a patron, Hometown Cable. Show that you also appreciate what Calvin and what I do, what Sam does, what all the people do. And that's $12 or more once a year. Become a patron. Say, hey, we like what you're doing. We'd like to contribute because there's no income coming. There's some ads. But uh, Calvin don't get any salary. Sam don't get any salary. I don't even get anything, but I accept a lot of satisfaction. So your comments are invited. Your money is appreciated and uh, your ideas would also be appreciated. Thank you for watching Hometown Cable. I'm Bob Venn, that's Calvin Castein, Terrence Gilroy. We'll see you again next Sunday with something new and different. We hope you enjoy that too.
I have chosen to welcome you to this important meeting from a local VFW post, very much like your own, because this is where our success begins. Each post, your post, is the heart and soul of the veterans of foreign wars. Some months ago, I was searching for a theme for my year as Commander-in-Chief. I read a book which galvanized my feelings about the pride and commitment we share in our military service, our status as veterans, and our role as members of the VFW. The title of the book and my theme is Call to Duty. The first call to duty was carried by a midnight rider and answered by a citizen militia determined that the precious spark of freedom not be extinguished in their new land. Because they answered the call, the intruding army was defeated and liberty found a home in the birth of a new nation. We had seen the last of the Red Coats, but we had not heard the last call to duty. Each time the call went out, new generations of Americans responded. In the Philippines and Mexico, in Europe and the Pacific, in Southeast Asia and the Persian Gulf, in places whose names were unfamiliar, we responded, we answered the call to duty. Preserved the safety of democracy, stood strong in the face of tyranny, and kept the lamp of freedom shining bright. But freedom had its price. For the countless brave Americans who gave up their lives, their living memorial is a strong, free America. And the two million plus members of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. By answering our nation's call to duty, we earned the privilege and the duty of answering another call. The call to serve our fellow veterans, our country, our communities. And whenever duty calls, as leaders and members of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, we must continue to respond, to answer the call to duty. The call to preserve and strengthen our veterans' health care system, to maintain a strong and ready national defense. The call to resolve the fates of America's missing in action, to put an end to the plight of homeless veterans. The call to bolster our legislative efforts, to foster patriotism and improve our communities. In the year to come, much of our action will center in the VFW's Iron Triangle. VFW's Legislative Service, Action Corps, and Political Action Committee. Increased involvement and participation in these areas is a priority. Because what happens in this building, and ultimately in this one, is because of you. You are the VFW. Our call to duty echoes out to each member at every post. Each task, large and small, is part of the fabric that is the VFW. We are the sum of what we do, our daily actions and their values. Like a stone cast upon a pond, each call to duty answer has far-reaching effects. Every task is important, whether it's working on a post dinner or fundraiser, helping with the voice of democracy, visiting hospitalized veterans, serving in community activities, decorating the graves of our honored dead, or raising public awareness and building Americanism through a parade or patriotic event. Each act is a part of who we are. At the post, county council, and district levels, we must remember the Veterans of Foreign Wars is a thread that runs through the tapestry of America and her history. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Those of us who lead are there to serve. As leaders, our call is to represent and work for the membership, to share the information, help build the motivation. As leaders, we must be today's equivalent of Paul Revere. Your members are your Minutemen. Each member gives the BFW its value. When one of our leaders is invited to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, we all walk into the White House. When one of our leaders takes our message to Congress, over two million of us are there. But there is no strength in numbers without deeds. Our strength is in our action. Our impact is the sum of what we do. Because you answer the call, hospitalized veterans will be cared for. Homeless veterans will find shelter and jobs. The POW MIA issue will be resolved. Our defense will be strong. And the light of the America we cherish will shine across the land. Honor our cause. Keep 
your commitment. Resolve now to answer the call to duty. Each of us answered our nation's call to duty and so became eligible for membership in the Veterans of Foreign Wars. By joining, we again answered the call to duty in the VFW. As we see the needs of our fellow veterans, that call to duty echoes today. Let us remember that the VFW is the sum of how each of us answers that call to duty. Our success lies in a positive, aggressive answer to that call. Join me now as we rededicate ourselves to all that the VFW stands for, as we again answer the call to duty. on a workday morning, and all over America, VFW members and their families are headed for work. In the heart of the nation, Kansas City, that includes the staff of your national headquarters, the nerve center of the VFW. Your staff and officers are beginning another day supporting the efforts and ideals of more than 2.1 million members of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. They're helping you transform ideals into action. Adjutant General Larry Rivers was at work early this morning, promoting the VFW's point of view on a news talk radio broadcast. What we at the VFW want to do is keep the, the armed forces of the United States military strong. As he enters VFW headquarters, his thoughts are on today's agenda. First up is a conference with John Sank, Assistant Adjutant General for Administration, Benny Bouchon, Assistant Adjutant General for Programs, Quartermaster General Joe Ridgely, and Assistant Quartermaster General Larry Maher. They have much to discuss because a lot is going on at your VFW National Headquarters today. This is the kickoff morning for this year's Voice of Democracy program. Director of VOD, Youth Activities and Safety, Gordon Thorson, is overseeing the staff's preparation of materials. VFW members will present these materials to thousands of high schools across the country. This year, our Voice of Democracy program will provide more than $2.7 million in college scholarships and incentives for some 125,000 high school students. Gordon and his staff are also the source of support materials for your VFW youth and safety programs. Another key support office for post efforts is Americanism and community activities. Director Mike Gormley helps your posts grow by promoting patriotism and volunteer opportunities with materials to support parades and patriotic rallies. Adopt a highway, march of dimes, keep America beautiful, and many more. On another floor at headquarters, Director of Buddy Poppy and Post Services, Jim Rowalt, is reviewing the new Buddy Poppy guidebook. Since 1922, the VFW Buddy Poppy program has raised millions of dollars to support our veteran service work and the VFW National Home. A valued VFW tradition, Buddy Poppies bring hope to disabled vets who assemble them and the needy veterans and their families who are served. The Buddy Poppy and Post Services staff are ready and willing to help you sell millions of poppies and keep your post records in order. Keeping posts on track is also the responsibility of the Administrative Services Department. Determining proper use of VFW envelopes, settling eligibility disputes, incorporating posts, and interpreting bylaws is all part of this important office. Another critical meeting is taking place this morning at VFW headquarters. Director of Membership Tom Kissel and Assistant Director Bob Kreider are planning future membership recruiting strategy. 
This department gives you the power of posters, mailings, awards, and other tools to reach out and support your one-on-one -on -one recruitment efforts at the local, county council, and district levels. All of the work done by VFW National Headquarters is important.